Open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 7. Uh, Genesis 7, and we're going to look through Genesis 7, and then the first 12 verses of Genesis chapter 8. So we'll go from Genesis 7-1 to Genesis 8-12. I really wish I could go back in time and have a conversation with 10-year-old Sean Wilson, and then 16-year-old me and 28-year-old me. And tell myself at various stages in life, Sean, enjoy this. Sean, just enjoy being a kid. Love those after-school cartoons. Have a blast playing soccer and football with your friends. Childhood is a special time of fun and development. Don't be jealous or upset over what you aren't allowed to do. Enjoy what you can do in childhood. I'd like to go to teenage Sean and remind him to find happiness in the awkward years of being a teen. Just get through those braces, have a blast in youth group, and don't be afraid about the transition to adulthood because God has you. But the one Sean Wilson of the past that I would really like to talk to the most is the Sean in his mid to late 20s. And I want to tell him to really, really enjoy those years with the babies. Because people keep telling you when you have babies, you know, those years come by so fast and it's come and go so fast. And it's true. Uh, the past 13 years, my house has gone from one baby to now a 13-year-old, 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 7-year-old. And those days flew by. And now I'm a little disappointed with myself for actually thinking things like, I cannot wait until we are done with diapers. Or I can't wait until I no longer need to bathe these little people. Or I can't wait till we can stop loading all of these kids up in car seats. And now all the baby responsibilities are gone. And I just find myself sometimes thinking, where did all of my babies go? One of the great tragedies in life is not recognizing the good times while we're going through the good times. And if you are walking with God, in love with Him, in love with other people who are made in His image, we should all be able to say, every phase of life from childhood to retirement, even to those final fading days before we go home to Christ in glory, all of these days are the good days. And what we're going to discover this morning is that even in the darkness of the storm, even in the chaos of the floodwaters, Noah could say, these are the good days. These days are good because even in judgment, God brings grace. And my hope and prayer is that through this message, we will begin to not be people who beg God to allow us to escape the days of trial and tribulation, loss and heartache. But even in these times that we could categorize as judgment, we will see God's grace in the midst of these times. We will recognize the gifts that God gives to us, even when before we might not have noticed their presence in our lives. So we're going to start in Genesis 7, 1 through 4, with the warning that the rain is coming. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. And you shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. To me, this is one of the great moments of trust and obedience in all of the Bible. 
the Lord comes to Noah and says, Noah, it is time. It is time to start packing up the boat. Now, packing for a vacation, uh, that can be fun and exciting. You know, daydreaming about all the enjoyable things you're going to do with your family, fun at the beach. But I got to say, having done it a couple of times, packing to move is awful. And I couldn't imagine packing up and knowing that everything that I know in my life is going to get washed away and I'm going to need to begin everything from scratch at the end. And not only that, but you're not just packing up yourself and what you need and maybe a a pet or two, but you're packing up your family and all of the supplies that you're going to need for two dogs, two cats, two pigs, 14 cows. This is crazy. Seven days of nothing but packing. I love how commentator Derek Kidner put it. Seven days provides you with urgency, yet no haste. Diligent working, but no time for postponement. And this little detail, in a story that is lacking a lot of little details we would love to read about, the detail that the packing of the ark began seven days before the first drop of rain, the final warning before the coming of the floodwaters, this detail shows us the grace of God to provide warnings to his people. The Bible is filled with warnings. Warnings of the consequences of sin. Warning of the return of Jesus Christ. Warnings of future judgments. Warnings of persecution for those who faithfully follow Jesus Christ. Some of Jesus' best parables and stories were warnings. But in a land filled with frivolous lawsuits where we are now almost overwhelmed by warnings, where you have baby strollers that warn us, remove child before folding up the stroller, or cordless drills that warn us they are not to be used as dental drills, (laughs) jet skis that warn us, do not use a lit match to check the fuel levels, and my favorite, rat poisons with a label has been caused to find cancer, cause cancer in lab mice. We often roll our eyes and overlook all the warnings. Please don't do this in the scriptures. The warnings in the Bible are a wonderful grace from God. Just imagine if Noah would have responded to God's warning to begin packing up the ark with, yeah, I know. But that's seven days from now, God. I got got, got plenty of time to do that. Although maybe that's what happened to the dinosaurs. Maybe Noah started too late and just didn't have time for the triceratops. But there's such, such a tendency to look at the warnings of Scripture and just put them off and put them off. I'll start looking and living for the return of Christ once I reach my retirement years. I'm going to put off this sin habit and continue to do it a little bit more until it negatively impacts my daily life. But right now I can handle this sin. We need to remember God did not put his warnings in the scripture for his own health, but for our benefit. God was so gracious to give Noah the ideal time to prepare the ark. 100 years for the construction and the collection of the animals. Seven days then to put it all inside before the rains fall. And I don't know how much more radical time difference you can get between 100 years and then seven days. But both of the warnings were perfect in the wisdom of God. And the Lord has given you a book filled, not with basic suggestions and helpful hints, but we have the Bible that is filled with perfect warnings given by an omniscient creator to help you live for his glory and your good and the good of those in your lives. And we need to begin to see the warnings in the Bible, not as burdens to carry, Not as killjoys to stop us from having fun here, but we need to see warnings for what they are. They are gracious gifts of compassion 
from the God who knows the end of our story, from the beginning of our story. So we first see how grace comes from God's warnings. We also see how grace comes from God's commands. Look now at verses 5 through 16 of chapter 7. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. There went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. It came about after seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, In the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered the ark, that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. The narrative of the beginning of the flood reigns has two bookends that are holding this dramatic story of wind and rain and waters bursting forth from the deep together. The bookends of verses 5 and 16 are the commands of God. Notice that Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him in verse 5. And then if you skip down to verse 16, you see the results of following God's command is a place of safety and security for Noah and his family. Noah, his family, and two of every animal, they entered the ark of God safely as God commanded them. And then God, like a loving father, tucking his children into into bed at night, God closed the door and secured the shelter. Now, this section of the story is easily the most violent section of the story of Noah and the flood. In verse 7, when we read that Noah entered the ark because of the water of the flood, it reads with a picture as if the floodwaters were chasing Noah and his family and the animals into the ark. It reads as if Noah was pulling the last animal in through the door. As the ground that was at their feet turned from dry to puddles that were filling your footprints to all of a sudden a pool of water in front of the ark as they were racing to secure, I'm going to guess the last animal probably into the ark was probably a possum since they kind of move like this, getting that last possum into the boat. And then they're in there secure. And following that, we have the great deeps bursting open, volcanic eruptions of water from beneath the earth, the floodgates of the sky dropping water on the earth as never before seen and never seen since. The very continents of the earth shifted and changed in those 40 days. This is a storm that no hurricane coming up from the gulf could ever hope to match. Yet in the midst of all of this violence, we have Noah and his family, like children being tucked into bed by a parent. Noah and his family safe and sound in the ark. And why were they safe in the ark? It was because they were surrounded by the commands of the Lord. We often see God's commands in an even worse light 
than his warning. The commands in the Bible are, are burdensome. They take the fun out of life. Often we can be like the disciples who after the disciples heard Jesus say that a man can't divorce his wife for whatever reason he wants to, the disciples responded with, oh man, Jesus, if it's going to be like that, if it's going to be one woman for life, it'd be better off not getting married at the start. But the commands of God, as long as they are not used to justify us, to make us right in the presence of God. God's commands are not burdens, but they are wonderful graces. They provide us with the gift of abundant life in this world. They provide us with protections from the very worst of the curse. They bring us joy in godly living, hope for future rewards and glory. You see, God is not commanding you as an overburdened father who wants to ruin your life. Instead, He is the most gracious of heavenly fathers. He is giving you the best gifts you po He possibly could to help you live the best life you can live on this earth. And that is a life surrounded by His loving care. And the care that God surrounds you with are the commands in His Word. And one thing we want to note is that the commands of God... They didn't stop the storm from flooding, from coming. They didn't stop the rain waters from falling. Instead, they protected Noah in the midst of the flood. And this is further emphasized in verses 17 through 24 of chapter 7. Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubit feet higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished. Birds and cattle, beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth, and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Then he blotted out every living thing upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky. And they were blotted out from the earth. And only Noah was left, together with those that were with them in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. In that narrative of the ark in the midst of the flood, what struck me the most in my studies were verses 17 and 18. And what really hit me was that while the waters were piling over the earth, we read about the waters covering every mountaintop, causing the death of untold numbers of people, men and women, children, the aged, destruction and devastation worse than any Hollywood blockbuster. What happened to the ark as a direct result of the flood waters. The flood came and the flood itself was what lifted the ark above the mountains. The waters prevailed over all land. And the Hebrew text very vividly says in verse 18, not that the ark floated upon the waters, but what it says is that the ark walked upon the face of of the water. The judgment of God did not overcome those who rested in God's grace, but the judgment itself was a grace of God to allow the ark to rise above the terrors of the earth and to walk above it all in grand fashion. Judgment throughout the Bible most often is not pictured as water. 
The most common picture of judgment in the Bible is fire. And there's a reason that fire is used as the picture of God's judgment beyond the fact that we have the lake of fire described as the eternal resting place for those who reject God. But fire is God's picture for judgment because fire does two things very well. First and foremost, when we think of fire, we think of how it it destroys, it it burns. What first comes to our mind is a house fire, a forest fire. Maybe that time we we put our hand on a hot stove and and we burned it and, and it hurts so bad. Fire can be devastating and horrific. But at the same time, a controlled fire, a fire that burns in the right place, and in the right environment, can purify. Fire cleanses metals of their impurities. Fires clean forests of deep, rotten undergrowth so that future trees can grow. The fire of God's judgment, or in this story, the the water of God's judgment, not only brought destruction and an end to those who rejected God, and His gift of life by grace through faith. But God's judgment also purifies His people so we can be more productive in our remaining years in this world. God's judgment will also purify the accounting of our lives at the judgment seat of Christ so whatever we do in our lives in single-minded purity for God's glory will remain for His glory and a testament to our obedience. You see, God's judgment was designed to purify. It was designed to purify by making holy, by by separating the the precious, the, the valuable metals from the dross in your life. And this is the great thing about God is that even when we think of the judgment of God, and it would cause us to to tremble in fear of God, that even God's judgment is really for our good. God's judgment is for our help. I would even argue it is for our glory, because we need to see that it is God's judgment that will one day highlight our faith in Him, our obedience to His Word, and the sacrifices we have made for Him. Who would have ever heard about Noah without the story of the flood in his days? Yet through the judgment of the flood, Noah's steadfast faith in God ends up being as wondrous a story as Jesus walking upon the water to his disciples. God's judgment is not designed to break his children, but to purify us to uplift us above the churning waters of this cursed generation. So what we see in the story of Noah and his flood is that things that God brings into our lives that we so often see as burdens, they aren't burdens at all, but they are gifts given to us in compassion. God's warnings, a gift. God's commands, a gift. Even God's judgment is a gift for us. And then this brings us to my favorite of the gifts in this section, and that is in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, God's concern for us. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed. And the rain from the sky was restrained. And the waters receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. In the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. The water decreased steadily until the 10th of the month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. God remembered is one of the most delightful and encouraging statements in all of the Bible. 
For someone who grew up watching superhero cartoons and reading comic books, whenever I read the two words, God remembered, in my heart and in my mind, it stirs up emotions of Superman hearing that call for help or Spider-Man's spider sense going off. Or Luke Skywalker, when he was training in Dagobah, sensing that his friends were in danger. That moment when the hero of the story realizes that his friends are in trouble, at that moment watching it, you can say, fear not. The hero is on his way, and we know he's going to win in the end. And here we read, God remembered Noah. So fear not. God knows exactly where Noah's boat was floating upon the waves. God knew exactly where Noah was in the bowels of the ark working with his family and the Lord is coming to help his own. And while we can sometimes wonder, are God's commands and warnings and judgments Are they really a gift when it comes to God's consideration for us? His face shining upon us in the midst of our struggles. There is no doubt that this is a gift. And not just any gift, but the greatest of gifts. God remembering the Israelites in Exodus chapter 2 was the beginning of the Israelites' rescue from the land of bondage. In Psalm 8 Chapter 8, verse 4, we have that famous line of, What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Well, the Hebrew text uses the same word in chapter 8, verse 1 to say, What is man that you remember him? And in the poetic structure of Psalm 8, 4, we can see that God's remembrance of us is equal to God's care of us. So whenever God remembers you, take comfort, my friend, that God is coming to take care of you. And the one thing that we know about God looking at his character from the beginning of the scriptures to the end is that God's compassion reaches to the lowest and to the deepest of us. Christ's love stretches to the farthest. Christ comes to us in our sins and in our failures, and when when we deserve wrath and loss for our sins, instead God remembers us in our weaknesses. We need to remember that when God looked at the world in our sin and God sent himself to this world, God did not come in wrath and in judgment, but we read, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. God remembers us in our weaknesses and sends his son to redeem us and to save us. In judgment... God remembers. In darkness, He is the cleansing presence that washes away our sins as the flood water cleansed our world in a way that the efforts and actions of man never could. And the final form of grace that comes to us in the time of judgment is one that I feel like has come up a bunch of times in my sermons and maybe it's just because I remember it because I struggle with it so much and maybe I'm not the only one, but it is the grace that God gives to us in waiting. Look now at chapter 8, verses 6 through 12. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and he set out a raven. And it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him to the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days. And again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. 
So no one knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. Now to understand how long Noah has been waiting in the ark, we need to remember that the 40 days at the end of verse 6 need to be added to the 10th month in chapter 8, verse 5. So Noah waited seven months for the water to recede enough for the tops of the mountain to be available, to be visible, and for the ark to come to a resting place. He then waited another three months, and then he waited another 40 days. He has been waiting 11 months and 10 days until he sent out the first raven. Now, we've all been forced to sit through delays at times in our life, whether it's waiting two hours for a plane to take off when we're already sitting on the runway, or waiting for two, two years of chemotherapy treatments to take effect. Waiting is the worst. And here is Noah, waiting month after month in the same boat, trying to keep the squirrels out of the alligator room, trying to make sure that the rabbits don't multiply too much before they can let them out of the ark, cleaning up animal stall after animal stall every single morning, the same thing every day. He finally sends out the raven and the dove just hoping against hope that there would be some place on this ruined earth for them to exit. And through all this time, there is no word from God. And they wait, and they wait, and they wait. God had remembered Noah, stopped the rains from falling, began to push back the waters on the earth, and yet Noah was still waiting. And it almost pains me to say this next sentence, but even waiting should be seen as a gift from God. You see, the scriptures often speak of the importance of waiting on God. I looked through the passages on waiting in the scriptures this week and saw that waiting gives the following benefits to God's people. Waiting brings strength, endurance, it feeds hope, it vindicates the shame. Waiting allows us to grow in wisdom, Waiting brings the favor and the loving kindness of God. Possibly the most picturesque verse on waiting in all of the Bible is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become wearied. And this is what we need to always remember when we're in seasons of life where we feel like we are just waiting for the next thing to come around the corner. And that is the Lord knows better than you and He knows better than I all of the benefits of waiting upon Him and His timing. He knows how waiting can shore up deficiencies in your life, how waiting can increase your hope for eternity, how waiting can provide wisdom to the simple. So since God knows all of these things, what is God going to do? He's going to put us in situations where we need to wait. We need to wait to recover from an illness or an injury. We need to wait while stuck in poverty or in loneliness. We need to wait to hear from Him in His Word as we open the Bible and look for some type of answer. You see, we, I'm, I'm saying we because I'm assuming you're all in this boat with me and Noah probably. We hate waiting. We don't want to go through it all. But it is so beneficial I'm going to guess that the last thing Noah wanted to do after seven months or 10 months or 11 months and 10 days in the ark, I find it interesting that we know what was going on 11 months and 10 days into the ark. Probably the last place Noah wanted to do, to be, but it was for his safety. And it was God's love for him that he had to sit 
and wait and wait. So my encouragement to you is don't curse the days of waiting, but see them as the gift for what they are. Continue to be productive as you wait upon God. Noah was very wise to send out these birds and to check on the state of the world following the flood. Noah was faithful to continue to care for the animals. Waiting was not a time to pout and despair. I need to say it again to myself. Waiting is not a time to pout and despair. Waiting is not a time for bitterness and anger. Waiting is a gift from God. But we can ruin that gift. You can ruin the gift of waiting by becoming hardened and spiteful. But instead, allow it to build up your hope, increase your endurance, and reward your faithfulness. Few stories in the Bible throw judgment right in our face like the story of Noah's flood. But judgment is one of those things in this world that can, on the one hand, be glorious. Judgment is glorious if you are the defendant who is just declared to be innocent. Judgment is glorious if you are the gymnast who just finished your routine and you were judged to have the gold medal winning performance. On the other hand, though, judgments are terrifying when you are condemned as the guilty or exposed as the hypocrite. For children of the Most High who have been saved and covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, for us, judgment should be a good word. For us, judgment should be a message of grace. We should take pleasure in knowing first and foremost that when we are judged by God, God will first judge us as righteous based upon our faith in Jesus Christ. But judgment also provides so many other gifts, graces from the Lord. And may we not lose sight of the fact that the warnings, the commands, The care and the waiting on God is all ultimately for His glory and even our good. So may we not cower before the judgments of God, but may we see how God is gracious to us, especially in these times of judgment. Please stand for the benediction. Lord, may you remember us this week. May you remember us in your care. And may you help us to grow in maturity, to see how even your commands and your judgments, to see how your thoughts upon us, how even waiting for your goodness to come, are all ways that you are gracious and loving to us. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.